Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to Winter Summit 2021, day five, real estate and construction tech. So my name is Elena Ruiz, and I am an investor at the Ventures team here at Black and Play. I am very excited to have you all here today, some people in person, a lot of us virtual. And yeah, before starting, let's jump into the agenda for the second week of Winter Summit. So this week, we'll be covering the smart cities and travel programs. So today we're enjoying Internet of Things and real estate and construction programs. Tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll be having energy, then mobility, and finally, travel and hospitality for Thursday. And for today's session, we'll be having an interesting panel discussion on construction innovation with our guest industry experts. Then we've got the chance to invite our dearest friend, Jal Tamar, CEO of SolidBlock, we will be talking about asset tokenization. Right after, we'll be offering the floor to a real estate and construction batch eight startups graduating today from our acceleration program. And from there, we will wrap up our session with the closing remarks. And before starting, um, let me remind you some housekeeping rules. First of all, please everyone um, remain muted, obviously except presenters. Um, also, please submit questions with the Q&A button, button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And also, there will be a poll at the end of every three to five startups uh, asking if you would like to connect with the startups, uh, and then we will facilitate the, the introductions after the event. So first of all, let me briefly talk about why we prefer to talk about build world tech instead of just real estate tech. As most of you may know, our real estate and construction vertical makes part of our smart cities block, and this is how we see it. So we're investing in build world tech, not just in asset level technology, in things that help real estate owners sell space better, but we're investing in reimagining what physical space means. We're focusing on what the monetization and the economy of physical space means in a digital world, and especially in a post-pandemic world. Because, for instance, the business of building and running office space has always been pretty one dimensional. So you're in the business of selling business space. You basically build it out, you make it safe, you manage ingress and egress, HVAC and so on. But you never in a million years thought that in buying an office building, you also bought a power plant or a data center or a solar tower. So this is why us here at Black and Play, we aim to shift the conversation. And so moving on, here are some of our investments in the space this year. Investments we've done in three different countries within three different continents. Starting by Randu in the USA, which is a vertical construction SaaS company that offers a materials marketplace. We also invested in Acasa, a Colombian startup that is helping homeowners move to their new homes before selling the previous one. And I'm happy to disclose our latest deal in Spain, Sazumi, a SaaS to ease the renting process from search to living and unite in home subscriptions. So we are proud to support all these founders and keep supporting more than 150 founders every year across all our verticals. And now jumping into our panel discussion on construction innovation, let me introduce our guests, Judy Doy, Innovation Manager at Kajima, one of our corporate partners, Raymond Levitt, Operating Partner at Black Conventions, Matt Gray, Founder of, at Buildworld, which is the premier global network enabling buildings and infrastructure professionals to learn about important trends and technology, and Diane Eisner, CEO and Founder at Core, a platform for real estate job site and crew management. All right, I guess we can kick start. Um, hi everyone, this is Yuji from Kajima. 
um, today, I want to very, first of all uh, very much thank everyone who has joined this session, um, especially the lovely panelists we have today. I will introduce quickly after after this, but also the plug and play team doing the hard job to let me have uh, this great opportunity. And also and everyone who has joined this session, as well as all the people I have met through my journey uh, working in innovation. So um, quickly, I would like to introduce myself. Um, I'm, I'm again, Yuji Doi from Kajima. Um, I'm leading the innovation work uh, through our company. Um, so we are a construction company based off in Japan. Um, we do several types of construction, um, commercial infrastructures, all the way to the uh, industrial energies as a general contractor, as well as uh, design and architects, as well as we do a lot of real estate development as well. So we have been partnering with uh, Plug and Play for a while, almost already uh, no, more than three years that we have been working on. So um, that led, led me to have this great opportunity. So today we have three great uh, speaker as a panelist. I will, I will not take time to um, introduce them. I will let them to speak from them, their self. But first, um, Ray, Ray with Black Corn Ventures as the operator um, partner. Uh, he will bring in a lot of investors kind of standpoint, and as well as he have a deep uh, background in the academia with Stanford. So I'm really, you know, I'm always inspired uh, from him whenever I talk with how he sees the uh, construction uh, uh, innovation in the construction. And then Matt, um, he has a deep uh, experience in the construction as well as now he leads the community called Black, uh, Built Worlds. Uh, very enthusiastic to bring people together. So I very much you know, enjoy working with him. Uh, last not but not the least, Diane, uh, she's a serial entrepreneur. Um, uh, currently she's working with a company called uh, Core, uh, which she's a founder. And I really um, like to hear a lot of her experience, not just in the construction, but out from the construction, which you know, uh, will bring this panel as a, like a great diverse discussion. So um, before doing uh, further, I would like to hand it over the mic to um, the panelists. So um, how about Ray, can you take the first step here? So I'm happy to join this call. Thank you to Plug and Play uh, for hosting it and all of you who are online. Um, Yuji asked us to say a little bit about each of our backgrounds and how we got into the um, situation where we are today, the position and the interest in construction tech. Uh, my own background is civil engineering. Um, I grew up in a construction family, studied civil engineering, worked at the trades and also in the management side of construction for a few years, went to graduate school and probably stayed in graduate school too long because when I graduated with a PhD, nobody in the construction industry would hire me at the time. So I became a professor first at MIT and then at Stanford and got involved in construction startups because as I mentioned, I was an accidental professor and still very practically oriented. And there were opportunities with ideas students had come up with or our research had developed and, and other outside opportunities. So I was involved in three startups I became an angel investor with the proceeds of the later two, which were more successful than the first one. And then when Blackhorn launched its first seed fund, I was ready to retire from Stanford. And so I joined them to be the partner who leads their construction tech investments. We have now made more than 20 investments in construction companies over the last four and a half years. And some of them are doing very nicely and others not so nicely as you would expect in a venture fund. So we're hopefully learning something from this and uh, looking forward to hearing uh, about, you know, the perspectives of the other panelists. Great. Thank you very much, Ray, for that. Um, how about Matt? Can you take the next one? You're on mute, Matt. Can you unmute? I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, Matt Gray, I co, let's see. Um, see how did i get into this I, I grew up in the construction industry also um i guess a lot of us who are in this part of the sector came came from it at least in the early days um from inside the industry um ran a uh, a mid-sized construction company and then in the early 2000s started a software company um called uh, grade beam we were a uh, bid management system uh, we sold to a company called Textura in uh, November 2012 and 2013, 
Textura had a six hundred fifty million dollar IPO, and it was the it was at that time possibly the only construction tech uh, play to exit. Um, and so that started me on a mission of uh, what's next and where where does the industry go from here and what's possible. Uh, created a, a research organization to try to find out uh, the answers to those questions. And uh, that group grew as people got involved and became uh, the network that is Built Worlds today. So uh, connecting investors and startups and uh, industry players um, around the world in this particular sector and helping to provide uh, information and insight to those groups to advance the industry. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. So like sure. Hajima um, recently joined BuildWords, I think from this uh, February, and it has been a great experience. So hopefully a lot of more people will join here. Um, that's, I think, the uh, great part of this. So yeah, um, so Diane, um, can you take the next one? Uh, yeah, so um, I also grew up in a family where most people were either truck drivers or they were in the trades, primarily electricians, HVAC. And I always joke that if I were born a boy, I would have gone into the trades, but because I was a girl, I went off to college and uh, ultimately did other things. Um, so probably most notably, I started the US Office of Ways, the navigation and traffic application, uh, went through selling that to Google, um, worked with probably about 1500 cities uh, in the course of that to figure out uh, how cities could use some of this data to reduce congestion and improve emergency response times. Uh, then I went off and started the city's division of WeWork, uh, which was short lived, but it helped reintroduce me to the problem facing, uh, facing construction industry, particularly around labor. And then I went off and, and started this, this company and um, it feels so great to have all the, the worlds collide, you know, construction and tech coming together. Uh, and, you know, my whole career has been about logistics uh, with Waze and I'm on the, the board of several trucking companies and marine transportation companies. And my perspective on this is that we need uh, what we're calling logistics for labor. Uh, we lose a couple hundred billion dollars a year on uh, lost productivity. Um, and, you know, it's uh, it's something that we, we should really try to deal with, not just from the perspective of the labor shortage, uh, but from how do we make, how do we streamline the way that we work today so that it's, um, it makes people in the field happier uh, and, and they're not wasting time waiting for materials or for someone else to finish their job. So we're looking at that complexity and, and having a blast. Great. Uh, thank you very uh, everyone for the uh, quick intro. I guess you know um, we can see that this great diverse team that we are having. So um, I would like to um, start with the first um, uh, question. So I would like to keep it a little bit broad because um, not everyone is related to construction as an audience right now uh, in, in in here. So maybe you know I want to talk about uh, the type of, uh, the kind of the trends that we can see in the construction right now as an innovation. Um, as a like a nature of the construction industry, we tend to focus more on the uh, operation side, like operation efficiency or like that, because we run the, a lot of construction operation, right? But compared to, I, I feel other industry, they are more focusing on the product and the business side as well. So I think that's the nature of the construction in general. So having that, having said that, um, like if there's anything that you see as a construction innovation trends or um, like what makes like construction more innovative? If you have any thoughts around that, that would be great. Um, so how about Matt, can you, how about starting with you about this topic? Sure, uh, in terms of construction innovation trends, I think the industry has, at least our from our research, up until quite recently, the industry was very focused on digitization of the work flow, the core workflows around project management um, and possibly some accounting work. Uh, there was really not a, an appetite among the our member construction companies, which tend to be the most innovative, um, prone innovation receptive of the, of the industry. 
as evidenced by the fact that they pay money to be members of our network to learn and and ad and, and find opportunities to adapt. The, the, the majority had been very preoccupied and, and had uh, relatively little appetite for um, IoT, robotics, um, extensions of their uh, enablement beyond project management. That started to change as we saw in, by 2020, uh, adoption was about 95% of project management systems. And so the companies were, were able to start looking at other, other aspects of tech adoption. And um, a couple that I think were pretty interesting in terms of the traction that they gained through COVID um, particularly accelerated um, interest in a jo any job site IoT sensor devices that would help them have a better understanding of what's happening on the projects remotely. So we definitely saw um, a, a significant increase in adoption of uh, cameras and other sorts of remote sensor devices um, on the job sites, especially you know, through COVID. So I would say that's probably one big area of uh, sort of increased um, activity. And then maybe that's more of a, we talk about the, the near future and then <laughs> kind of the, the, the farther future, um, just a proliferation of robotics. Um, plays for the industry, uh, uh, just a, a, an, an enormous proliferation of those companies. Um, so that's a trend in terms of the number of startups in that sector. Still adoption is, is, is pretty um, embryonic, I would say, but maybe those are a couple trends, if that's helpful. Yeah, that was great. Um... Yeah, I, I highly envision with that. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, how about Diane? I guess there was certain thing that it caught your mind about this. So maybe you came into the construction. So I would like to hear your thoughts about this. Yeah, I think it's a super exciting um, time in terms of change. You know, I come at this and in, in, uh, always looking at oh, what problem is there to solve. And if you look at building in general, you know, 35 to 40 percent of, of carbon emissions, you look at affordability of our housing, you look at um, lack of labor, there are some pretty, pretty big fundamental issues. And so I like looking at the trends, whether we're involved or not, for example, of um, materials, sustainable materials, materials that change the supply chain. Um, how do you use local materials so that you're not relying on the global supply chain as much? So definitely um, excited about trends in materials. I'm excited about trends in culture. And by culture, I mean, I guess, stakeholder alignment. Uh, I think in the past, there was a lot of siloing of owner, developer, GC, sub, field, office, what are the tools that can bring people together? And some of it is basic like communication uh, and, and tooling. And I think some of it is more interesting like what are the economic models or incentives that people will really share? Uh, so, you know, how does a developer come into a neighborhood and, uh, you know, get some of the locals to buy in to really be part of the neighborhood? And uh, I think there's a few crypto examples that are pretty interesting there. Same with, uh, with trades. So in some of the larger companies, you do have things like stock options now, but thinking through from the trades, from the field, how do they benefit from some of uh, the efficiencies that we're going to gain from technology? And is that you know small ownership stake similar to stock options, but on the projects that they're working on? So I'd say that all of these are kinds of cultural things. Um, I guess I'll also just go ahead and say that um, some of the bigger construction companies have done a great job this summer shutting down billion dollar, multi-billion dollar job sites uh, when um, racist graffiti, for example, was found. And so those kinds of shutdowns didn't really happen before. And it's pretty exciting to see people stepping up. So that second bucket, I would say, is related to, to culture. And then um, I guess the third thing that I'm watching is, obviously, you guys know that I'm into the field and, and, and into the labor and the worker. Um, but, you know, there was a time when our trades folks were heroes 
Uh, and then I think media kind of got stuck on this, like, you know, butt cracks and plumbers thing for a bit. And, you know, if we look at the future um, and we think about, you know, the kind of uh, almost like superhero potential. We've got exoskeletons happening in the field. We've got computer vision on helmets that are in the field. Uh, we've got a ton of safety technologies, a ton of computer vision and AI that's helping in the field. So I really feel like there's this like uh, trade enabling technologies that are really interesting. And I think those are the three buckets that I'm looking at. Great. Um, I really like the way that you said that, you know, not even that it's not your territory, you're thinking beyond there, and as well as with, um, that you touched upon the culture. I think that is very important part for this, um, uh, like a culture shift for, you know, in general as innovation. So I really, really like that point. Ray, um, like covering as a, you know, like a whole, I guess you have a lot of perspective. So I think everyone is very enthusiastic to hear about your opinion about this. Yeah, I will take the, give you the mic about this for this. Thank you, Yuji. So first of all, a historical perspective. I think you all know that construction has been singled out as being a laggard in terms of adopting technology and having essentially zero productivity growth for 50 years. And we've seen article after article say that and I would like in their defense to say they're not stupid or lazy. They couldn't use technology on construction projects until you had smart mobile devices that were connected to the cloud. And once that happened, you saw plan grid take off and become a unicorn in about eight years, almost a unicorn. You saw many other companies grow very fast. And so like in every other kind of technology, the first thing people tend to do with a new technology is what my old professor used to call, they pave the cow path. They look where the cows used to walk and they paved that. So you take a paper-based paper -based process that used to exist in the industry because you couldn't use computers on job sites and you digitize it. So the whole first round of innovations as Matt says was digitizing workflows pretty much the way they had been before. And then what you find is after that, after a while, after people have digitized a lot of the key workflows, they figure out that this actually allows the business relationships between the parties to change because you can do things much faster and in a more transparent way and avoid duplicate data entry and, and errors introduced by data entry and so on. And so then you start to see interesting things like fintech apps that speed up payments. One of the biggest problems in the construction industry, in my opinion, is we have made the least credit worthy people in the process finance projects by waiting 90 days to get paid. And so we see a number of companies, Texture was one of the first ones, but we see a number of other companies coming up with more creative ways to do this. In part, I think jump started by COVID when inspectors didn't want to go onto job sites to verify progress, people started using digital images. And so I see FinTech plays, I see um, a number of technologies that are um, helping to assess risks with existing buildings for example, what's their earthquake vulnerability? What's their flood vulnerability? And then you start to see insurance innovations like parametric insurance that build on these kind of technologies. And so I see the industry growing up very quickly to be in some ways similar to others. The big difference with this industry is that however cyclical the economy is, the construction industry in a region or in a, in a metropolitan area is 10 times as cyclical. And so the demand fluctuation makes it very difficult to employ large amounts of capital without it becoming stranded capital in a downturn. And it makes it very difficult to sustain long-term debt with fixed interest payments. And so the industry has always had to be capital light. And with the worker shortage, which might be helped a lot by the kind of things Diane was talking about of the culture change where a construction worker is not you know, a bozo whistling at, at cute girls going by, but is actually a talented person using information technology and, and so on. Um, we, we see a lot of platforms to help uh, align workers to job opportunities because of the shortage. So we're seeing labor markets being formed that replace what unions used to do with their hiring halls and uh, replace the shared cost of training that unions used to provide with online training services and so on. And then the, the last thing, <coughs> that I would say is when one starts to see all these um, point source solutions pop up, people end up with a, a proliferation of point solutions that are all data silos. And integrating the data across those silos into some kind of a virtual data pool in the cloud, and then coming up with very clever analytics to 
develop high level insights like early forecasting of cost at completion like Brick is doing or marketing data, looking at past projects you've bid and current projects and advising you which ones have the best potential to focus your energy on. And all of this is enabling the kind of new business models that Diane talked about. But for example, healthcare facilities are not using fixed price lump sum bidding. They're using um, different business models that pay everybody their reimbursable costs and share profits that really start to align the incentives of people much better. And then in the building energy space, what I see is the, the old broken incentives where nobody has either the incentive or the ability to fix up a building's energy because of um, triple net leases that put all the energy costs on the tenants. Are we starting to see a number of companies arbitrage that opportunity with FinTech solutions? That's such a great point. Sorry, I won't jump in, but I just want to underscore that, that, uh, that that's super interesting. I, I love that these things are happening. Yeah, and you know the biggest part of the um, emissions carbon emissions from the construction industry are from inefficient old buildings that no one has an incentive to fix up. And that's starting to happen now with these FinTech solutions. Great, all right, thank you very much. Uh, that was very inspiring. I, I, first of all, you know, like the FinTech part, I guess, Matt, we had those kind of conversation in the last week conference. I think it was, there were some dedicated uh, spaces about that. And I think this is true. Um, a lot of things happening around that, how you know, maybe in, in the old days, it was a little bit of edge cases, not, not edge cases, you know, like a border cases of where you know uh, the technologies or the you know, innovation kind of gets merged with other industry, other territories as well. But you know, I think this is happening more. Uh, I think insurance as well. Um, this is great, and I, I kind of you know when when I was hearing from Ray about all these great stories, you know, like looking uh, looking into the innovation, looking into the startup, looking into trends. You know, not just where you're talking about the technology, but we're also thinking about you know how this can help to you know um, really innovate the business model or the way that we do the operations or like that. So we can kind of start seeing the much more bigger picture by having a lot of insights around this. So yeah, I really like all the, you know, uh, being about here. So um, because we have the limited time, I wanted to move on to the next question. So um, this might be a little bit different topic, but um, so when I work in this innovation world, you know, I just, I'm kind of a learner still um, here, or maybe maybe I will be I will call me uh, myself as a lifetime learner. Um, but you know, like kind of structuring or organizing the way I think about thing is very important. So I kind of you know like the kind of the categories of the word. For example, like uh, when we look into the um, when we look into the startup, we, like we call it like an early stage, mid stage, growth stage. When we talk about the corporate side standpoint, like we say, we think about the long, short term, mid term, long term kind of things. Um, for example, in a, you know how we work with the uh, when we work with the startups, it's like a built by partnership, and you know at, as innovation, process innovation, product innovation, business model innovation. Well, what I'm trying to say is there's like a typical three or four words that I kind of focusing on to you know think about how we digest the information like that. So my question to everyone is, um, do you kind of you know, have any of those kind of three words, four words thing that you kind of think about very carefully when you talk about business or innovation or technology or like that? Um, I know that you have a lot, but just want to I just want to ask you to highlight um, some part of uh, those kind of things. So um, let's say, Diane, can you take the first step for this? Sure. Um, but also, I just want to say this is like such an interesting conversation. Everybody's points are are so um, relevant. But um, yeah, so I, I guess there's three terms I think about. One is uh, platform, and you know I think it was was Ray that was talking about going away from the point solutions into the platforms. And you see that the platform companies are the ones that are succeeding. So whether it's Procore or it was PlanGrid, and there are a couple, um, but you know, I have tons of innovation, you know, heads coming to me and saying, can you do this? Can you integrate this? And, you know, we're a startup. So I say uh, later, right now I have to do this. But I think that um, the point solution uh, issue is so problematic for companies that we really need to figure out categories that are within platform. And it's, you know, how do we bring the data together? How do we bring the companies together? Nobody should have a timesheet app. 
anymore. I mean, we should be so far beyond that, um, but we're not. So the word I think about a lot is platform, you know, a single platform for communication that's used by multiple stakeholders that integrates tons of data. Um, a second term I think a lot about is uh, verticalization. And uh, by that, I mean, I'm seeing really interesting examples of um, owners that are developers, for example, or GCs that are now self-performing, or uh, if I look at vertical uh, infrastructure, you know, there's thousands of, you know, upstart city projects that are happening right now, whether it's, you know, a few dozen families or large projects like Neom, uh, which is a giant city. How are we going to help scale uh, all of those different initiatives? And we need to have some verticalization of our infrastructure. So a stack, if you will, that is uh, electrical, that is water, that is, you know, you know, what are these stacks look like? Uh, and so that's more, you know, if you, you think about platform, that's like the external stuff, right? How do you plug into all this external stuff? When I think about um, verticalization, this is more internal. It's how are we organizing our operations so that we can work differently and figure out new economic models and get the resources we need. So I think about that. And then I guess the third thing I think about is, um, you know, how to be hyper-local at a global scale. Uh, so obviously in my world, I need to make sure that, you know, we're working toward having, um, you know, real-time work workers deployed, right? Real-time real workforce planning. And we need to be able to understand what is the data that's uh, coming in, when, when are people needed, who has the skills that are needed, and whether it's internal or external, that doesn't really matter, but it does have to be local but you need the same system to, to be deployed globally. So, I mean, Yuji, as you know, we're already in three countries already, even though we're an, we're an upstart because fundamentally um, we have an opportunity for a global shift, but we need to work within our local resources, local suppliers, local, um, uh, local workers. And so, you know, I think we have a lot of figuring out to do. And I feel like the supply chain issues we're all suffering from now are helping us realize and we'll probably accelerate that. Uh, so those are, I think, how I am categorizing things right now. Great. Um, this is very insightful, hyper-local at global scale. Yeah, I think this is the thing that we are all working on. So yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, Ray, can you take the next one? Yeah. Sure. So I talked about the data fusion, you know, AI analytic kind of solutions to us that is at this stage with all these point solutions out there both solving a data integration problem, but also enabling new possibilities such as better forecasting uh, to intervene early and um, better targeting of marketing activities and better selection of subcontractors and deciding which architects to work with and so on. So data fusion and, and analytics is one area. Uh, something that's very interesting to us is a very specific thesis about prefabrication and modularization especially with the growth of accessory dwelling units in states like California, Colorado, and others, there's a profusion of companies with various approaches for building ADUs or complete homes, or even uh, multifamily companies like Modulus doing garden apartments in the UK and so on. But for us, the lesson to be learned from history goes back to the 1960s and 70s when Operation Breakthrough was instituted by Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, who was director of HUD, coming from American Motors, who was told to build houses like cars, teach the industry how to build houses like cars. And so he persuaded a number of big companies to set up capital intensive bathroom modular factories, kitchen modular factories, modular volumetric housing units, and so on. Every single one of them went bust during the Jimmy Carter stagflation area about 10 years later. And so because of the cyclicality in this industry, if you're going to do prefabrication, and modularization, our thesis is it's got to be the opposite of the Katera approach. It's got to be very capital light, very efficient, very targeted, and ideally cross-sectoral so you can take advantage of counter-cyclical industry cycles between, say, commercial, industrial on the one hand and residential um, infrastructure on the other hand. And we're probably about to pivot from a commercial industrial to a residential infrastructure with these low interest rates now and with the infrastructure bill in the, UK, in the US being passed. So those are two 
And then the third one are the fintech solutions are very interesting to us because there's so much financial inefficiency in this industry between construction loans, between the trade credits that subcontractors get for the materials, and then the ways that big projects are financed by insurance, pension funds, and so on below prime. There's a huge opportunity to exploit there to make the flow of funds uh, work better for everybody in the system, including the banks. Great. This resonates a lot for my uh, learning as well. Um, Matt, I think you have a lot of point here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I just was thinking about your your question about threes and what do we what maybe do we think about in threes? And for us, you know, built, built worlds the the project was really to try to understand not only what are the transformational technologies, the potentially transformational technologies in this industry, and how might they develop, but also just to think generally about um, what what are the what are the impediments to transformation in this industry and, and, and how, how do those get overcome? Because again, my own personal experience was I was simultaneously the CEO of a software company, well, of a leader of a software company that I founded that was selling solutions into the industry and the leader of a construction company that was trying to be a leading construction company. So I, I was kind of in both camps. And what I saw was on the one hand, some very passionate and dedicated and smart people developing solutions that were truly, truly would be helpful to driving efficiency and productivity for a construction company and, and wanted to get those solutions to market. And on the other hand, I saw a construction company whose management team truly wanted to be innovative, truly wanted to lead, truly wanted to be progressive. And I saw the challenges in this industry of bringing those two groups together and really actualizing. So you have people, they have the same goals fundamentally, but structurally there are impediments to adoption. And so, Build Worlds became as much about what are the interesting potentially transformational technologies in this industry as it became about what are the impediments to achieving that transformation and how do those get overcome? And so we look at, we study that a lot. And um, in just again, as I thought about your question about threes, we tend to perhaps overly reductionist on our part, but we tend to group our industry players in threes. Um, so there are, are those for whom uh, they're in a space of monitoring or becoming aware. They're, they're interested in monitoring what's going on or becoming aware of what's going on. This is a sort of a passive audit. Um, posture. Something might happen and they might have to respond if it does happen and they want to be in the loop. They're sort of positioning, posturing for fast ad adoption, right? Potentially. Then there are, there are the companies that are engaged. We want to be engaged. We want to be engaged in the conversation. We want to be experimenting with things. We want to be piloting. We sort of have conviction that things are happening that are strategically important for our business. And we have conviction that we need to be active. We can't be passive, but we're not in sort of the third phase, which is really the transformational phase and the companies that are truly committed to transformation and are truly structuring and putting the, their, the receptors in place uh, to enable that transformation to happen within their organizations. And so those are kind of the, we, we call that, that latter group, the adopters. And, and, and so we've got, we've got awareness and then we've got engagement and then we've got adoption. And, and we really assess our, our members and, and really in the, the broader marketplace, we really try to look at what are the companies that are 
that are in each of those modes. And, and if there are 700,000 construction companies in the, in the United States, 99% are in the, are, 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 are outside of the first two of the, of the engagement and adoption phase right now. Um, so it is a, there is a massive hill still to climb in this industry. And, you know, we're, we're great, great journeys begin with a single step. I mean, we're, we're probably at least two steps into this journey, but there's still a, a, a lot of road ahead of us. So that's really, um, for us, uh, that, that's, that's one of the things that comes to mind in terms of culture and the industry and structure um, when you ask about how we think about threes. Great. Um, I really you know, appreciate all your support to help this industry move forward. Um, I think even in those three words, I mean, uh, you know, awareness, engagement, and adoption, you know, not just about the co one company, like in, even inside a company, you have those three, like a certain, you know, like adopter to, you know, a uh, laggard kind of thing. So kind of, you know, as my role, I kind of suffer in that territory as well. But um, since we are kind of start running out of time, I want to move on to the main question that I wanted to talk about. So, um, um, which is the title of this panel. So, um, uh, so zero to one, this is the thing that I wanted to talk about. So as a kind of a corporate standpoint, you know, when we you know, think about the uh, technologies, the you know, our engagements, the startups, I feel it's more like an incremental kind of development improvement. For example, you know, uh, applying some like a tools of uh, the great product or like like that. No, we still don't you know bother so much of our own operation or like that. We just kind of augment you know uh, utilize that kind of tool. But I guess from the startup standpoint, you know, it's all about zero to one, right? Like you totally create something from your scratch, you know, uh, think about that as an innovation that is so much great. And I, like myself being as an innovation manager, I kind of sit in between there. Um, so I feel like, you know, like a, like a company like us, we have to also think, start thinking about the zero to one, not just thinking about incremental improvement, rather how we can really, you know, get help from the innovative uh, company like uh, what Diane is doing. So how, how the you know um, we can think not just about the incremental but thinking about the zero to one, which I, I kind of feel this is one of the process innovation that we have to take on. So um, I know this is a little bit you know hard question that could be asked, but um, do you have any kind of thoughts around here, um, Ray? Uh, like, what was my question clear enough for you? Yes. So you know. I would rephrase your question to say, you know, is there a Tesla for the construction industry that doesn't start with a General Motors chassis or a Ford chassis and tries to put an electric drivetrain in it, uh, but, you know, designs the car, including all the software in it from the ground up to be an electric vehicle and, you know, to have either one or two motors to be two wheel drive or four wheel drive, but from the ground up it's designed to be different. I think it's challenging to imagine creating a construction company like that. Michael Marks tried to do it at Katera. The trouble is it takes a lot of capital. Look how much capital it required for Tesla to reinvent the automobile. And then all the other companies, Rivian and others that are following now. Um, so again, as you mentioned, as uh, Matt mentioned, half of the companies in the construction industry, if you look at the Census Bureau, have zero employees. That means they're a mom or pop company, not a mom and pop company. It's just one person with a wheelbarrow who's a sidewalk paving contractor, right? And so in that industry, you know, how do you, how do you create a zero to one? It's very challenging. What some companies have done is to create separate divisions, you know, as subsidiaries that eventually will replace the parent company while they keep the parent company going. Um, Skender tried to do that in Chicago to create a prefab facility. And unfortunately they were hit with COVID which derailed that uh, prefab thing. And Stacy Scapano is now somewhere else. Um, innovating. But I think it's quite challenging to go zero to one. I think more likely what people will do is adopt point solutions one by one. And, and um, subscription software in the cloud has really made that easy to do because each one of them can be sold by users or by projects. And if your number of users or projects go down, you can scale down your subscription. But I think it's quite challenging to imagine 
something like Procore is serving every possible, you know, digital need in construction or Autodesk BIM 360 or anyone else for that matter, and a company just instantly going digital across the board. I think it's a journey the culture has to change, as Diane mentioned, and that, that will probably be more evolutionary than revolutionary, in my opinion. Yeah, I, don't, um, yeah. I, don't, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I'm trying to be realistic. Well, I, I mean, even for the, look, I think those culture shifts, I think having a little bit of zero to one mentality, I thought that will be helpful. So yes. it was more uh, looking in that way as well. Yeah. 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 So Matt, can you, uh, can, do you have any opinion about this? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm a little, I'm <laughs> not surprising. I'm someone in Ray's, Ray, I'm in Ray's camp. I mean, the, you know, I grew up again, my family being in the Rust Belt here in Chicago, I mean, our, the core of our business in the 80s and 70s, 80s was serving the big three automakers and the, uh, you know, U.S. Steel and General Motors. I mean, those were the, those were our top customers. And, you know, today, uh, you know, Nucor is, their market cap is, is, more than the combined market cap of all the integrated steel producers, whatever's left um, in the United States. And, and Nucor, it's not that US Steel and Inland Steel and Republic Steel and LTV Steel and all these giant companies had these golf courses. And you worked for these companies, you got three months vacation paid in the summertime. I mean, you know, they, they were massive employers um, and uh, they had electric furnace divisions. They had all the money. They had all the ability to, to be Nucor, but they weren't. Only executives who left Nucor and started a whole new company based on, you know, selling, uh, based on a business that was totally different, that made the structural members for uh, Butler, but, you know, for, for, for what was modular in warehouses at the time became Nucor. And similarly, you know, the big three automakers, I mean, those were our customers and General Motors. I mean, they were, uh, Toyota came to the United States. And I remember we, we, we went the Tesla factory in San Francisco, new United Motors. I mean, we, we were hired to go and put an addition on that plant so that, you know, General Motors and Toyota and General Motors are going to learn all these things and go back and, you know, create, compete and, you know, by, by 1995, Toyota was our biggest customer in the automotive industry, and we hardly did any business with the big three. So I, I just, I'm really skeptical of uh, companies creating a new platform while their own platform is on, on fire. Although I, I have to say, I, mean, I still am vice chairman of my family's construction business. We're doing quite well right now. You know, the industry is healthy. This, these could be very long-term trends, um, but, you know, I sit and I look at Autodesk when we started in 2017, 2018, Autodesk's market capitalization was I think about $18 billion and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure other people know exactly. Um, and about half of their business was outside of the design and construction sector at that time. And they were Air Force, you know, Boeing and so forth, aerospace and so forth. I, I think, the majority of their business is is in the design and construction sector today, and they're an eight, almost an eighty billion dollar market cap company right now. So, you know, I just think uh, I don't know. I think um, the the it's much more likely that the Tesla of the future in the construction industry is going to be somebody who's not currently in the construction industry or that we don't maybe think of as being in the construction industry, but maybe we wake up and find, huh, though they're actually more in the construction industry than somebody we've traditionally thought of as being in the construction industry because more of the value, the, the value that's created is is going to that company than the other companies. Like Elon Musk's tunneling company, Boring, right? <laughs> yeah, or CoStar, you know, closer to home. I mean, in this, in this, uh, in this, the context of this discussion, I mean, I remember CoStar when it started, 
you know, in the in the in the real estate sector, I, I don't know. I haven't kept up with CoStar's market cap right now, but I think it's north of thirty billion dollars. And I don't know what CBRE and JLL and Cushman. I don't I don't know what their combined market cap is, but um, you know, I think there's some interesting things to think about in all of that. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, Diane, can you? Um, uh, take the last one. Yeah, I think zero to one is super important. Um, I'm also a realist, which is really disappointing that Matt Ray and I, as the optimists of the oh, industry, oh. feel a little nervous about about you know our desire for a zero to one. Um, but um, but I will say this: um, innovation is incorporated into almost every GC in some way, shape, or form right now, and it tends to. Uh, happen pilot by pilot, right? Which is, um, you know, I, I just talked to a company that the other day that had 150 pilots running. Our well, I think that's going to be really hard to scale. Um, so right now it's like a pilot on a project. Um, <clears throat> even when I'm piloting with companies, it's very important to take an ecosystem approach because if just the executive is excited, that's not going to help the PM. If just the PM is excited, it's not going to help the field. I need to make sure that the execs, the field, and the office are all totally aligned when they're using our tools and that they're all excited about it and it's benefiting them all. So one is looking at, you know, the different, the different bits of the ecosystem. But one way that I've started to hear about is entirely new projects where the whole project is kind of a pilot, where it can have a different economic model, it can have different technologies incorporated, um, and then push that to something I was talking about before. And you've got essentially massive developments, which are small cities. And then you look at, do, look at those as pilots. And so I think there's something about just being able to scale this notion of pilot bigger and bigger and bigger as a way to eat this. Um, and I would also say that there is a, a, a Tesla coming. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it's called Neighbor. It's Bjarke Ingels and Ronnie Bahar and Nick Chim's company. Um, and they're definitely yeah. like playing with direct to consumer and they are um, directly playing with these different models and, and integrate, you know, I was talking about verticalization. I was thinking of them as well. Um, so I, I really do think these things are coming and they, they are inside of the industry, but they couldn't do this inside of, a, of their existing companies, right? They had to go out uh, and, and try this uh, and try this thing. So um I'm optimistic, but humans, the, the fragmentation of the different stakeholders, that's what we got to solve in order to get from zero to one. But we have to, we don't have a lot of time. I mean, I'm thinking about climate. I'm thinking about, you know, losing labor. I'm thinking about how nobody in California can afford a house. I, like we have to deal with these. And so some way we have to figure this out. Very happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very sorry that we can talk this forever, but um, it seems like we are running out of time. Um, so um, uh, let's uh, do this conversation offline as well um, after this panel. Over but, drinks. Oh, yeah. Over <laughs> so um, I would like to close this. Um, I'm sorry, I had one more question, but I will I will not uh, reach to that. I'll reach out to that. Um, um, First of all, thank you very much, Ray, Matt, and Diane for joining this panel. I think um, all the audience, uh, audiences uh, enjoy this talk. Um, hopefully we'll have the next round sometime soon, but um, uh, thank you very much again for this uh, great opportunity. Also, uh, thank you very much, Plug and Play, for uh, giving me uh, this opportunity to, to, the lead, uh, to lead the panel. So with all that being said, uh, I would like to uh, close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juji, Matt, Raymond, and Diane for this interesting panel on construction innovation. And it's exciting to envision how this space is changing and will grow in the future. And now let me introduce you to my colleague Jill Tamar, CEO of SolidLock. Today, Jal uh, is going to be speaking about a super interesting and innovative trend in the intersection between fintech and proptech, which is asset tokenization. And she's going to explain to us how this is connected to decentralized finance. So welcome, Jael. Thanks for being here with us today. And the stage is yours. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Yael Tamar, CEO and co-founder 
of Sala Block. And I'm here to talk about a really exciting space of DeFi, decentralized finance, and how it can benefit property, right, from all sides. Um, on the one side, property owners, and on the other side, property investors, and then the whole ecosystem of property. So we're going to talk about how we can transform any asset into a tradable financial product. So before we talk about DeFi and what that is, let's talk about what CFI is, right? CFI is centralized finance, it's traditional finance, where banks govern and control people's assets, right? So this is what we have today. Anytime you send money, likely it goes through a bank or PayPal, Venmo, and, and similar systems. By contrast, DeFi, open finance, individuals or institutions can sell funds, send funds directly to each other. In addition to that, individual is the custodian, can be a sole custodian of the assets, meaning if I want to hold stocks and bonds, if I want to hold real estate, I don't have to re rely on third-party databases. I can just hold it in my wallet, right? You can use professional custodians, of course, and likely that's where banks are going to go, right, into those services. Now, another thing about DeFi is that it's an open source, uh, mainly an open source ecosystem, meaning that developers, you know, software developers from all walks of life can come in and start creating different applications, right, on this open source software, which is really, really cool, right? Now, you can have traditional assets like real estate, gold, silver, and, you know, private equity, and you can also have new types of assets. I'm sure that all of us here, or many of us heard about the NFTs, right, non-fungible tokens, which are new types of assets that have sprung into the market. And then together with all of that, you have a lot more transparency of, you know, all the issues surrounding real estate, right, which is by contrast to today's system, right, which is very opaque. Now to review CFI versus DeFi. In CFI, you have individuals or institutions and a bunch of banks in the middle. Sometimes you can have up to 20 correspondent banks, right? Sending money from one place to the other in the world. By contrast, DeFi system, you have two, you know, a sender and a receiver, and then a network of computers in between that facilitate that transaction, which is much faster, more, more efficient, cheaper, and so on, right? So I'll just give you an, a quick overview of examples. You know, think about in the traditional real estate, what lending looks like. There's, you know, mortgages, there's um, some private equity lenders, there are also some P2P lenders um, that, that are, are available as well. In the DeFi space, uh, individuals can pool their assets together with the help of blockchain. And then you can collateralize these assets and you can help, um, you can collateralize these assets and you can borrow against these assets through this DeFi ecosystem. You have different decentralized exchanges that facilitate um, exchange of different assets, right? That you can, you know, you can exchange one real estate asset or a piece of real estate asset um, for the other. Right. So there, there are different types of uh, stable coins as well. So these are asset backed coins, uh, which is also a really, really cool space uh, in the crypto space. Usually they're backed by crypto assets. And in the real estate space, we'll see stable coins backed by real estate assets. Right. So how do we get access to this DeFi space and this DeFi ecosystem? How can real estate assets today, how can we take a hotel? And, and, you know, a commercial asset, how can we take that and take advantage of the DeFi space? Well, first and foremost, the first step to get from where we are right now to this new uh, ecosystem and, and uh, this, this new uh, space of DeFi, you need to digitize the assets, right? You need to tokenize the assets. So that's what we do at Solid Block. We take um, real estate, and we help convert it into a financial product. Now, how do we do that? So first, you know, think about the real estate space. $300 trillion in value. Only 1% of that today is liquid, right? Is, is liquid and, and that's publicly traded REITs. 
By contrast, when you look at private equity, it's pretty much the opposite. The majority of private, the majority of equity, I should say, not necessarily private, but you know, is actually in IPOs, right? So in, and that's that's where we, uh, uh, that's where we're asking ourselves, you know, where's the market opportunity, and it is in real estate. Right. So um, the world is much more receptive to blockchain recently. The regulators are receptive. You know, in the last 10 years, um, the, the whole market has made uh, amazing progress. Right. It has made amazing progress in this space. Uh, so what does it mean to tokenize a real estate asset? Right. Tokenization really means two things. Uh, it means you will likely securitize an asset and then you will digitize it. Now, um, we securitize large assets. We need several investors or a lot of investors to come in and fulfill, you know, and and uh, and complete the investment, right? So if you have, let's say, a large commercial asset, you will likely first securitize it, uh, meaning create a special purpose vehicle and then issue securities to investors uh, from that vehicle. And eventually that vehicle will buy a piece of the asset. Right? So that's a normal securitization. That We didn't invent anything there, plain vanilla. Right? What's new here is the digitization component. Instead of writing the ownership of this security on, um, you know, in a database online or maybe in a PDF somewhere, we digitize it. Right? So we digitize it and we record the ownership on the blockchain through a smart contract. What does that allow us to do? That allows us to um, now trade this security, right? You can trade it peer to peer over the counter, and you can also trade it on um, eligible and compliant exchanges, right? So that's what we have. We have securitization and digitization together. That's tokenization. Now, in some cases, in some cases, we don't need to securitize. And what are those cases? When we have one buyer for one asset, right? Let's say you have um, a, one buyer of a condo or, you know, over a hotel room or, you know, it's a small asset. In that case, we can actually issue NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Um, and those are pretty popular right now. And those can be traded without, um, you know, these compliant exchanges and so on. Because at the end of the day, all you're doing is just trading assets, right? Not securities. And you're using blockchain to do that, which is very clever. So what are the benefits of tokenization at the end of the day, besides gaining access to this DeFi ecosystem that I talked about? Well, let's review. Tokenization is when you take rights to an asset, right? You're a passive investor. You have rights to revenue coming from the asset, either interest or dividends, right? You convert that to digital tokens, and then now you can trade them, right? So this process makes the asset more attractive because it's more transparent. You have, you know, usually place the asset on some sort of a platform like Solid Block. Um, you have people looking at it from all over the world, right? So it becomes more attractive and also valuable. So uh, we know even before tokenization, if you put an asset into a REIT, it becomes more valuable. Appraiser, appraisers will appraise it higher. Right. And now, again, the demand for the asset will increase. Right. Because you can attract global investors. So these are all benefits of liquidity. Right. So um, and in general, the process, what I mentioned, the process of tokenization um, involves what's called the security token offering, uh, which, uh, you know, number one, step number one, securitization, issue a Reg D506C uh, security or a Reg A plus or Reg CF, right? And then afterwards, um, issue the digital token to investors, which they can hold in their wallet or in a custodial wallet, right? So Solid Block, for example, offers a custodial wallet. We can hold your tokens for you, just like any other brokerage would do when you buy stocks and bonds, let's say on interactive brokers. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about all the issue, different issues of storing your assets uh, uh, on your own device. Um, so, and then eventually, you know, you, you will be able to trade, right? You'll be able to trade. So you have control over what you're investing in, right? So let's review the setup process. Set up a vehicle, a special purpose vehicle, onboard the investors on some sort of platform, make sure they undergo KYC, AML, and accreditation, then create digital tokens through a blockchain program, 
right? And then finally list these securities and exchanges so that the owners of these securities can easily trade, right? So these exchanges are normally alternative trading systems, ATSs, um, basically FINRA registered institutions that have a license to trade these, um, uh, these securities. So I'll give you an example of a project we did, which was really the first commercial real estate tokenization project, the St. Regis Aspen Ski Resort, um, which issued um, elevated returns. The, the management company issued the Aspen coin and we, Salablock, created um, you know, all the tech infrastructure and the smart contract. So the project was really a, this was really a textbook uh, project. It raised $18 million from 22 investors, mainly accredited investors and funds, um, with the investment ranging from $10,000 to $2 million plus. Um, it represented 19% of the equity in the project. And, um, and then it was listed on an exchange called T0. And uh, it, 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 it was trading and it's now still trading at a 20 to 30% premium. So to recap, what are the benefits, right, to investors and to sponsors? The benefits to investors are easy, right? This is liquidity. People, instead of sitting on uh, five to seven years on a project, you, you can exit much earlier. And the benefits to sponsors, majority of the sponsors are sitting on a large amount of equity, right? Look at the St. Regis. These guys literally, you know, um, had, you know, the whole asset value was around $230 million. It was mortgage on the property. They were sitting on $90 million worth of equity, right? For many, many years, right? So instead of sitting on all that equity, they leveraged and they took $18 million out and, and distributed it to um, investors, to LPs, right? They, but obviously, there was a management fee that is being charged um, from these investors, right? So, so they're still managing the hotel and they're still benefiting through carried interest, you know, once this uh, portion of the hotel is, is sold, right? So it's a win-win for everyone in terms of sponsors. Now, since then, since we did the project, um, the space has evolved significantly and now um it's actually uh, possible to tokenize the majority of the equity stake right so you're not going to tokenize 100 percent, but you can go up to 60 70 percent of the equity in the project right so that you can actually go and build more projects with the cash that you're getting right so uh what i mentioned in the beginning of the presentation right remember the decentralized exchanges lending and also nfts so I believe that that's the future of real estate, right? So, um, you know, real estate being traded on a variety of exchanges, centralized and decentralized. You know, if it's a security, then obviously they have to be compliant exchanges. Um, and if it's an NFT, it's a very, very easy way of transacting for investors that are investing for the sake of getting profit, right? You don't necessarily have to buy a house to to rent it out and to you know get your you know monthly passive income you can actually buy a property through through an nft and then um you know get the income anyway without the whole hassle of uh you know title switch and and you know transactions that are very uh cumbersome right and of course the lending is very 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 interesting lending outside of the banks also think about real estate projects um, that get bank lending are considered much more risky, obviously, for investors, because if the project is uh, default in default, obviously, the investors are never going to see their money right in that scenario. In the DeFi space, the lenders are, um, you know, they're on the same level of the capital stack, usually as the equity investors. So that becomes, you know, very, very attractive as a model. So what I want to leave everybody here with is imagine you walk into a bank right today and you have a hundred thousand dollars, right? So you come to the bank with that money. What does that money um, award you? What does it give you? Well, you can, you know, make it a down payment on a property and then the bank will give you a mortgage. You can put it in your, you know, some sort of a, a savings account and get interest or you can, uh, 
put it on your credit card and start spending it, right? Basically payments, right? So imagine that sort of environment and that sort of world when you come in with your digital real estate, instead of $100,000, you come in with $100,000 worth of digital real estate. Again, you can get loans, you can do payments, you can do uh, credit, you can do, uh, you can invest that, reinvest that, you can actually, you know, put it somewhere to get interest. So, you know, on top of the interest that you're getting automatically because, you know, real estate is paying you out um, some, some interest or dividends. Um, so, so, so imagine that world of decentralized finance that is catering to the real estate backed digital securities, right? So that's really, really cool. And I, and I, I love to kind of uh, in a few years from now, go and revisit this, this presentation and see how far we got down the road, you know? Um, so that's it. Think about tokenization as a base for what's coming for what's coming for all of these new all of these new things um, that 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 we'll see in decentralized finance and one thing that i want to mention that's not in this presentation um, but i think it could be really uh interesting topic for everyone is the metaverse um specifically also because facebook has now rebranded as meta and real estate should really be looking into into the metaverse you can buy and sell um, real estate and buy land in metaverse right now. And tokenization is a really important component in the metaverse as well. So, and I'd, I'd be happy to, to make a separate presentation on the topic. Um, and if you have any questions for me, uh, please feel free to email me, uh, find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, um, at Yael Tamar you know, Instagram, any, pretty much any platform. I'm very accessible. So be in touch. Let's do, do interesting things together. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jael, again, for taking the time to connect today here with us uh, for these amazing insights also. And congratulations on putting together such an amazing startup as it is SolidBug. And now let me introduce you to my teammate, Kishore Kumar who will be presenting our real estate and construction tech batch eight startups graduating today. Um, so yeah, Kishore, the stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alina, for the introduction. And thank you, Yale, for the amazing presentation on DeFi and how it can benefit the property, um, property system in this, this day and age, transforming any asset into a tradable financial product. Um, and also, thank you to all the panelists um, on such an engaging chat about construction innovation. Um, hello everyone, thank you all for being here today. For those who don't know me, my name is Kishore. I work on the Venture Smart Cities team at Plug and Play. I will be your MC for the startup portion of the Real Estate and Construction Expo. So for the past two and a half months, we've had the following startups go through our RENC program. These startups were selected by our corporate partners and today they're gonna sh uh, share who they are and what they do. After every five startups, we will be launching a poll, which sh you should see on the screen. If you're interested in meeting these startups, you should fill out the poll and we will facilitate introductions. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to use the chat box to communicate with our team and we will be happy to help you out. And now, without further ado, let's welcome our first startup for the smart infrastructure category, Swiss AI. Swiss AI utilizes the combined power of advanced AI algorithms, an extensive proprietary database, and large-scale computing to enable a rapid optimization of investment decisions in energy, mobility infrastructure, and operations. Please put your hands together for Swiss AI. I'm Anna Gavlikowska, CEO of Swiss AI, SaaS spin-off of ETH Zurich, Switzerland. Utilizing the combined power of AI, an extensive proprietary GDPR compliant database, and a large scale computing, Swiss AI enables its customers to perform rapid financial optimization of investment decisions in energy and mobility infrastructure and operations. Our energy products account for a range of technologies, including battery, PV, wind, heat, gas, energy management system, and integration into distribution and transmission networks. 
our mobility optimization allow our customers to perform optimization of private and public transport, logistics, real-time dispatch, fleet management, and life cycle planning for transition to e-mobility. Developers and OEMs can reduce system design cost by more than 10x compared to traditional processes while improving accuracy and profitability. Say one of our customers bids for a $100 million project. They need then to invest $1 to $2 million in the technical, environmental, and financial proposal preparation costs. If the end customer rejects the offer, it's a sunk cost. We can dramatically reduce the cost of preparation of the offers, allowing our customers to offer more projects to their customers for the same sales and marketing teams, increasing profitability and improving the top line. Our products enable commercial and industrial customers to optimize their assets to decarbonize, reduce electricity costs, and provide e-charging and energy balancing services. We support our customers by running a large number of investment lifecycle configuration scenarios based on hourly response. After analyzing tens of thousands of options in real time, the Pareto front on of return on investment is established. It literally finds the sweet spot of profitability for our customers. Cities and larger portfolios are also served by us. Our platform optimizes infrastructure to meet KPIs set by our customers. It finds the best solution with complete financial and technical lifecycle assessment by connecting generation with demand while accounting for trading and storage. The system then generates a standard repeatable and traceable report that includes financial sensitivities and quantifies the reduction in carbon emissions. Our core technology was developed at ETH Zurich starting in 2009 with a large team of scientists and engineers collaborating, validating and testing the platform in over 85 case studies with broad range of public and private partners covering Europe, North America and Far East Asia. We are looking for partners, investors and customers. So join us if you're interested in our story. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Swiss AI. Up next, we have Globechain. Globechain is a B2B ESG reuse marketplace offering external and internal reuse and loaning. They also generate ESG data on the impact. Please put your hands together for Globechain. Hi everyone, my name is May and I'm the founder of Globechain, an ESG reuse marketplace. Before I explain what Globechain does, I just want to explain to you about the industry. So global enterprises pay around two to three million pounds per year to dispose of fixtures, materials and assets. It's expensive, there's collections, warehousing and hidden waste costs with that. And also there is no audit trail to generate um, ESG data or any impact data on the back of that. Globechain helps companies reduce those waste costs by helping them list items on our marketplace and redistributing them to partners. That helps them reduce waste, eliminates uh, transportation and warehousing and provides them with positive ESG data. So we connect enterprises to nonprofits and small businesses to reuse and redistribute unneeded items. And one of our USPs is we generate ESG data on the impact of where those items go. We have two services, one called external reuse. That's where um, companies reuse and offer these items externally to the nonprofits and small businesses we have on the marketplace. We have around 10,000 members globally on that. And also an internal reuse system where you can reuse and loan assets and inventory within organizations or within your supply chain hidden in the marketplace and then press a button and offer it out privately and that is global. The way it works is a company will take a photo or it, we can integrate through an API into the system, list items onto Globechain. Globechain then sends alerts to its members. People will request the items, liaise within the dashboard, get booked in and arrange collection to pick up. 
The recipient is responsible for the logistics and Glowchain can offer um, couriers from a third party through an API integration. And on the back of that, we generate the ESG data on where the items have gone. For those of you who don't know what ESG data is, it's environment social governance data, and it's used to help companies um, with sustainability and waste reporting, tax offsetting, and on a really high level, it's used for credit financing, bond risk, share price, IPO. And then within construction, it's used um, for credit credits under lead and Briand points. There's just, this is an example of the dashboard, what it looks like, and it can be split into departments and suppliers, as well as we offer infographics on the percentage of reuse, upskilling, employment levels, which social impact was hit, um, if it was homelessness or refugees and so on. 70% um, of the materials that go through are from construction, the built environment, as you can see the images of carpet tiles, flooring and ceiling tiles. And it can help in multiple places from art centres, door sent to Ghana to help schools, children could be protected from the local wildlife. We also do furniture, office furniture, and we also work with retailers for fixtures and fittings and visual merchandise. So um, that's the end of the presentation. We do around 500,000 items per year and divert around 8,000 kilos diverted from landfill and save companies millions of pounds. If you're interested, um, please give us a call. Great, thank you so much, Globechain. Uh, next up, we have Oxygen at Work. Oxygen at Work helps companies reduce healthcare and energy costs by using data analytics and specific plans to improve office indoor air quality. Please welcome Oxygen at Work. All right, hello everybody. My name is Manuel Winter. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Oxygen at Work. At Oxygen at Work, we are all about creating healthy and sustainable office spaces. Now, when we think about office spaces, we think about them as an ecosystem because you have all kinds of different aspects that play a huge role in terms of indoor air quality. As you can see here on this illustration with people, ventilation systems, carpets, paint, etc. And one thing that is kind of a black box usually are natural plants, even though they have quite a large impact on the indoor air quality as well. And basically what we did is we went to quantify the, um, the whole impact of plants on the indoor air quality to ma make it an integral part of this ecosystem and really leverage its, its impact. Because when we talk about offices, we always have different goals. We want to create healthy spaces, safe spaces, but also sustainable spaces. And they all are, uh, can be kind of contradicting. Just let me make you one example. When we talk about relative humidity, which is what we see up here, uh, what we want to achieve in terms of uh, in, to create a safe space in terms of bacteria and viruses is to have humidity levels between 40 and 60%. However, mechanical humidifiers use a lot of energy. Uh, so the only real alternative would be natural plants to increase humidity and not uh, spend more energy on it. So basically, what do we do? We work on the one hand with architects and engineers uh, when designing new office spaces to make the plants an integral part of it. Then we have a whole service around the supply and maintenance of those plants. And we provide indoor air quality sensors with a sophisticated uh, data platform to really understand the indoor air quality and make sure and to track um, the targets that we want to achieve. Now, obviously, this has to look nice. If we use plants, it then needs to be uh, create an aesthetically nice office and work environment. But also, the numbers have to add up, of course. So, uh, one part of it would be the uh, the analytics platform, where we not only want to show what are uh, the CO2 levels, humidity levels, but really want to go into the details, as we can see here, in terms of what is the impact on different health categories in, in terms of comfort, well-being, ESG goals, and so on. And what do we get out of it? First of all, employees are much healthier and they feel much more comfortable in the office space. But also on the sustainability side, our clients uh, can save significant amount of energy um, since the plants become part of the office and therefore, for example, ventilation systems are less needed. We started uh, in 2017. We grew each year by at least 100% um, up until now. And here you see the six countries we currently have projects in. 
Here's a selection of companies we work with. You see large corporates, big tenants of office spaces, but also real estate service providers such as CBRE, JLL, who are our strategic partners as well. This is it. This is what we want to achieve. Uh, and please get in touch if you're interested to learn more. Great. Thank you so much, Oxygen at Work. Up next, we have Data AI. Data AI is a software company which develops retail analytics, SaaS-based solutions for brick and mortar retailers. Please put your hands together for Data AI. Hello everyone, I'm Miranda from Data AI and it's really good to be here today to see all of you and share with you our company. So Data AI is a AI cloud video analytic company that we serve retail store and offline shopping malls to understand visitor data better. Nowadays, when offline businesses try to adapt to data solution, they might need to spend months waiting for a, a hardware installation. They might spend a lot of money committed to a, a five-year, 10-year project that they're not even sure they want to do, or they might even need to uh, install extra hardware in their store, which will disrupt their business hugely. So all of these um, huge barriers are, are stopping the offline industry to adapt to data solution and um, going forward to the digitalization path. And this is why we develop our product Cyclops, uh, which only utilize online sur uh, surveillance camera to do visitor analysis, which will hugely lift the burden for offline users. So a few core technology that we utilize in um, our, our platform, the first one is Kubernetes, which makes our cloud service much more stable and also much more reliable to our user. And the second technology is TRTIS, which will enhance our AI model efficiency, which also means that we are running on a much lower cost compared to our competitors. And the last technology will be CRNN. So CRNN is an in-house developing technology that will enhance hugely our accuracy in analyzing uh, data through our AI model. So more accurate also means uh, we can get more accurate insight and also more accurate recommendation, which in the end will benefit our user much huge. So all of the technology combined together, Cyclops actually have the competitive advantage in both cost and also the level of quality. Another huge thing that people talk about when adapting to data solution will be the privacy concern. So this is also our top priority to secure our users and all the individuals from um, the data leak and data privacy concern. So what we do is we take um, facial detection technology instead of facial recognition technology. So what it means is that within the video, we're not looking into every individual's identity. We're not identifying it, we're not storing it at all. So uh, all the users are um, totally risk-free from breaching any of the uh, privacy regulation in the world. So this is how our platform Cyclops work, very easy. Um, video stream from CCTV got streamed up to the cloud first and we do all the AI analyst, uh, analytics there and uh, deliver back with the data insights to the front end platform to our users. And on the platform, there are also a lot of value based uh, value added service and features such as real time remote management or business intelligence report that has very actionable insights. And some of the very useful uh, actual use scenarios uh, in offline store. First scenarios will be in retail store, which uh, Cyclops will work together with store manager to get a really in-depth understanding of the store. For example, where are the visitors coming from? What are, what are the trends and what are the demographics? What products do they like the most in the store and where do they like, like to get in the store? And all of these data can help store manager to really come up with customizable and really tailored strategy for the individual store. For example, when you're run, launching a new promotions, uh, when, when you want to change the store layout, these can be very, very good support materials. And second main user scenarios will be in shopping malls. So in this scenario, um, the shopping malls really go ahead uh, using Cyclops to integrate all of the data together. Um, so for example, we compare different tenants' performance and benchmark them. Uh, we monitor different facility usage and public area usage, and we monitor the visitor from different entrances as well. 
So all of these data are brought together and integrated to our uh, very, very high level executives so that they can really understand what is happening in such a complicated mode and make a much better decisions when it comes to, uh, you know, no wonder it is, uh, no matter it is improving customer experience or uh, it is to uh, manage the tenants to have a better sales or to um, really change the position of the shopping mall. It really helps the shop manager to realize uh, the data value and also understand what is going on in this compl complicated offline space. So within one year of launching, these are the attractions that already gain uh, inside and outside of Hong Kong. They are some of the main shopping malls and international retail brands. And we are certainly very excited to look into overseas market as well. Uh, for example, joining PMP program grant us a really good opportunity to tap into the SEA market. And in the uh, future few years, we're also uh, looking to in coming up with more useful features and data analytics to really serve our users on exploring this data journey. So thank you very much, everyone. And my contact is shown as the page. And feel free to contact me or come up to our company webpage to know more about us anytime. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Data AI. Next up, we have IO Airflow. IO Airflow is a data intelligence platform that breaks down barriers to creating healthier and more energy efficient commercial buildings. Welcome, IO Airflow. Hi, I'm Matt Scobrook, CEO of IO Airflow. We're facing a crisis in buildings today uh, that they are emitting more energy than they should, consuming more energy than they should, but also emitting an unhealthy environment for their occupants. Buildings, including their construction and operations, uh, account for about 39% of the world's CO2 emissions and 36% of the world's energy use. And we know from the past 18 months that COVID-19 uh, is, is airborne and spread in areas like buildings unless proper steps are taken. Now, there are solutions to uh, help find these problems in buildings. Unfortunately, uh, those solutions are often cost prohibitive, which means older buildings, uh, which account for about 50% of uh, all global building stock, uh, can't afford or won't see a positive return on investment for this type of smart technology. That's where IO Airflow comes in. We are providing an affordable and effective solution to help commercial buildings improve their internal environment. We find solutions in buildings at a low capital cost to help um, increase health outcomes for occupants, reducing the risk of sick building syndrome and infectious disease uh, airborne transmission. We help find ways to increase energy efficiency and building performance by reducing energy consumption on site, helping our clients save money on operating costs as well as the cost a uh, labor cost of finding those problems. Uh, we have impact. Um, we can help um, reduce site, uh, re reduce energy consumption simply by um, helping to um, find efficiency opportunities in buildings. So, for example, um, through commissioning work, uh, we can help reduce by over 10% the energy commission, the energy consumption of buildings without needing to uh, invest in any additional capital equipment. What that means for our clients is a faster and more affordable opportunity, uh, allowing uh, our clients to be able to have buildings tested at a much faster speed and a much cheaper rate than current market solutions. How we do that is by um, providing a non-permanent hardware solution that gets uh, placed in a building for up to one week at a time. That hardware gets reused. You pick up those sensors and move them on to your next site, meaning there's just one time capital cost and no permanent installation costs, no IT integration um, uh, concerns. Uh, from there, the data that our sensors collect are uploaded and stored securely in our cloud-based server uh, and put through our suite of proprietary algorithms that help to identify uh, trends and concerns in buildings related to its efficiency and air quality. Our clients can then access that information both through a digital web portal or a client uh, report that is automatically generated. We're looking for solutions like finding ways to optimize thermostat set points, stale air zones, areas of pressure imbalance or thermal discomfort for occupants, and so many more. Our business model is one that is uh, highly scalable and highly effective. It's a licensing agreement that our clients can tap into to access both the hardware and the data analytics and software. 
Uh, what we are proposing for our clients is ways to help find more building problems at a more affordable rate. The subscription cost varies based on uh, our clients' needs, meaning it can be customized to their demands. And if someone doesn't want to pay the full licensing fee, uh, we do offer a one-time assessment to help them understand our value in real terms. Now, this is a massive market. Uh, the global commercial building retrofit industry is valued at nearly half a trillion dollars worldwide. We are focused specifically on those commercial buildings that can't afford uh, today's market solutions. So we call that buildings um, constructed around 1990 or before. Uh, and these buildings are the worst per capita emitters of carbon emissions and the unhealthiest environments for occupants when it comes to air quality and sick building syndrome. We believe that market, um, we can obtain uh, about 8% of it at scale. We're representing a cap of just over $4 billion. We'll get there by uh, first working with property managers who have a large portfolio of these uh, older uh, buildings, including school divisions, governments, or even corporations who have a large uh, real estate presence. We know that we all have uh, future industry verticals as well through energy auditors, energy service companies, architects, engineering firms, and more. Uh, today, we are launched with our ability to test for energy efficiency, performance, and, and virus transmission risk tests. Uh, we have an ambitious technology roadmap that will help us provide live data and building commissioning work for automated reports and um, it branching out into multiple industry applications after that. We have a high degree of traction in Canada and moving into the US by the end of this year with a growing international pipeline, including some of the country's top commercial property management companies. We have a high degree of funding and research support and have secured over uh, $550,000 US in non-dilutive grant funding to help both de-risk and uh, build the traction to where we are today. Our team has a shared um, management experience of over three decades in uh, startups as um, serial co-founders and industry expertise, as well as engineering and focus on data analytics, machine learning, and product engineering. Uh, we are uh, in just finishing a seed round right now where we have over 135,000 Canadian committed toward our $650,000 goal to help us grow, scale into the U.S., and uh, continue to maintain our fast pace of traction. Uh, with that, I'm excited to uh, pitch to this audience today and share more about iWorkflow, the impact that we are having in buildings to help them become healthier for the environment and for their occupants. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, IO Airflow. Uh, that was the last startup for the smart infrastructure category. So now you should see a poll pop up on your screen. The five startups included in this poll are Swiss AI, Globechain, Oxygen at Work, Data AI, and IO Airflow. If you're interested in meeting any of these startups and would like introductions, you can now fill out the poll and we can facilitate the introduction after, com after the completion of the expo. Uh, please fill out the polls now. Again, the startups included in this poll are Swiss AI, Globechain, Oxygen at Work, Data AI, and IO Airflow. Now, uh, we're moving on to the next category of uh, startups under construction tech. Um, for our first startup um, under this category, we have um, uh, LightYX. LightYX leverages new technologies from autonomous vehicles in order to communicate the blueprints to workers in a revolutionary way. Please welcome LightYX. My name is Tom Erlan and I'm LightX CEO and I would like to share with you a few slides. So we have founded LightX in order to solve one of the biggest problems in construction, which is the gap between what happens in the design to what actually happens on the real side. We would like to minimize this gap and we are doing so by projecting laser, laser layout on any surface in the construction site. So we can project your layout on the floors, on the ceiling, on the wall. We just need to download your plan and that's it. So the process goes, you download your plan to LightX Cloud and then it's available on your mobile. From the mobile device, you can control the projector and then the projector finds its location on site and it can project accurately in two millimeter, with two millimeter accuracy to the range of 10 meters. The projector or the device can also change plans on site and project it in real time. And you can save this change plan 
as a new as-built plan for documentation or for approval. Uh, here are a few more examples of projections. And the value that we give on site is that we save 80% of layout time and cost, and we help you build fast and right first time. You can see it in this movie live. We are living in a world where building information modeling has become vital to today's construction projects. Problem is, BIM coordination efforts often get lost in translation as soon as building starts, which can lead to cost and schedule overruns. That's where Litex comes in. We created a robotic system called the Litex Beamer 1. It's all about building right and building fast the first time. All you have to do is follow these three steps. Download the plan to your mobile. Position the Litex Beamer 1 robotic system using three reference points. Or a reference element. Choose the layout you want to project and start working. It's an APR technology that projects an adaptive projected reality of any two or 3D blueprints onto the construction surface itself with an accurate laser down to the millimeters. This way, construction workers can easily see the blueprints to scale without having to mark the work surface themselves. This means many day-to-day -day mistakes can be avoided. But there's more. Lightex's Beamer 1 can also detect mismatches between the BIM model and the as-built. The operator can then modify the projection on site by moving elements around on the app. All they need to do now is save the updated version and send it back to the architect for approval. LightX's innovation has become the answer for issues that arise day-to-day -day on construction sites. Building right and building fast. That's how we like to do it with the Beamer 1. Thank you for your time, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, LightX. Uh, Beware is our next startup. Beware provides a solution to de-risk construction digital inefficiency, enabling a Continuous AI-driven risk control on business processes. The floor is open. Beware. So hi, my name is Victor, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Be Aware. And Be Aware with the risk construction inefficiency through digitization. Most large projects suffer from severe budget overruns and delays. One of the reasons why this happens is because of digital inefficiency. Companies use obsolete and non-interoperable systems. Then they try to run hundreds or thousands of processes on top of it, and this generates more inefficiency. At Be Aware, we provide a cloud solution to continuously monitor risks related to these processes. Our solution connects to other digital tools, minimizing inefficiency to reduce budget overruns and delays, and we do it in a non-intrusive way. So not forcing customers to change their current tools or processes. As an example, I'm sure you know the ITER project. They expected to be operational in 2016, and now their expectations are by around 10 years later, 2025, with a, a, a budget that is four times larger than the expected cost. Many of the tools we use to manage large projects do not leverage advanced analytics. Even when they do, they are often not interoperable and performing transversal analytics to understand the status of projects is unworkable. Some companies try to adopt all-in-one platforms with new and interoperable tools, but this does not match reality where we work in consortia and tools are often imposed by the client or other partners in the consortia. We have the same problems again. 
On top of this inefficient digital ecosystem, we are trying to run repetitive process. So just think about documentation management, contract management, consent management, maintenance management. And that's why in this sector, workers spend 50% of their time on manual and repetitive tasks. So it's not surprising that productivity in construction is not improving, while risks grow with complexity. Let me show you an example based in this case on documentation management, where a subcontractor uploads a document, then an engineer and the doc controllers review that document, then we pass it to the client for the final assessment. If everything is fine, we are done. Otherwise, if it is, if it is rejected, we start all over again. As in any other business process, you have a set of questions related to risks in those processes. Will the subcontractor deliver in time? How many times this document will be rejected? Will I finish the whole process in time? And the answers to all these questions have a negative or may have a negative impact in my assets, my budget, my project schedule. And be aware we predict the answers to these questions. And remember, all this is happening in an inefficient digital ecosystem, and this is bringing even more inefficiency. This is Jacek, my partner at Be Aware and me. Jacek comes from a family with a long tradition in the construction sector. He heard great stories from his father about how complex managing a construction project is. He has vast experience in computer science, deploying complex systems, and always promoting customer-centric approaches. On my side, in my professional career, I've worked with one of the lead scientists who defeated Kasparov playing chess with Deep Blue, and later on with one of the co-founders of Xbox. We love complex problems, and digitizing construction sector is probably harder, believe me, than defeating Kasparov. That's why we created this amazing project, but this could not be possible without an amazing team and a strong advisory board bringing business development and construction domain expertise. We leverage more than 30 man years of experience in European Union funded research in risk management and artificial intelligence to enable risk driven real time optimization of decision making. Our solution connects to the existing digital ecosystem without replacing neither existing tools nor processes to collect evidence and understand how business processes evolve and provide continuous risk control. We enable transversal analytics, allowing digital tools to interoperate through our solution. Our technology has already been used in different projects, including the ITER project, which brought them enormous management capacities for the whole organization, helping them improve their reactivity and reducing budget overruns. They expect to see from one to two million savings per year thanks to the use of our technology. The market is huge. The number of potential competitors is also large, but still 95% of our potential customers are still using Microsoft Excel in order to manage these type of processes. Top representatives of the construction industry have validated our solution as we are the winner of the most challenging construction startup competition in the world. We have already raised around 1 million US dollars from private investors and grants. And basically we bring efficiency through digitization. And be aware we bring awareness to reduce delays and budget overruns. Thank you very much. Do not hesitate to contact us if you want to know more about our technology. All right, thank you so much, Beware. Next up, we have Flex Solutions. Flex Solutions is pioneering functional robotics with highly intelligent human-operated service robots that are miniaturized to operate in spaces that humans can't easily access. Welcome, Flex Solutions. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Bilski, an inventor turned contractor turned mechanical engineering professor. I founded Flex Solutions out of my own frustrations on the work site. Our team has spoken to hundreds of stakeholders across the construction and maintenance landscape in their own way they all describe the exact same problem. They can't get where they need to work and safely do what they need to do, something I've experienced firsthand as a contractor and licensed professional engineer. A key takeaway is that on the road to full autonomy, there are a number of construction and maintenance tasks that could be greatly improved by an affordable and user-friendly Cobotic smart tool for getting into difficult places without the need for ladders or entering confined spaces. Our solution is the FlexBot. The FlexBot is a modular snake-like robot one inch in diameter that's designed to fit into tight spaces to inspect, map, and autonomously perform the required maintenance. Every FlexBot link is identical and packed full of sensors, including a camera and flashlight. Combining multiple links with our patented extension and rotation mechanisms is what makes a FlexBot. Different end effectors can be easily interchanged, like a spray nozzle, gripper, specialty camera, and even a drill. Here's a use case learned from our corporate partners. After buying an existing building, it's necessary to map and inspect the structure to plan improvements and identify deficiencies. A FlexBot can be used in the ceiling to map and visually inspect all the nooks and crannies. 
And as we learn more about the environments our customers are using the FlexBots in, we'll be able to roll out additional functionality through software updates towards locomotion and autonomy. The FlexBot can even allow for next generation retrofits like aerosol sealing and occupied structures, and even fish wires after the drywall is up. Uses for the FlexBot extend beyond the walls of a structure to utility infrastructure connecting us. Workers can remain safely on the ground while still operating the FlexBot. Another use case we learned through the plug and play program is the inspection of active seismic dampers in buildings. The FlexBot alert costs less than a tenth of our competition while being smaller and more agile. We're playing in some multi-trillion dollar markets like building construction, utilities, and infrastructure management. We've also partnered with Gensler, the world's largest architecture firm, and Skyline Capital Builders to form Team FGS, phase one winner in the Department of Energy's $200,000 e-robot prize for minimally invasive building envelope upgrade technologies. We're starting with a cobotic smart tool that a user can insert into a cavity and it'll automatically bend to avoid obstacles. Using the same links we developed today and adding advanced autonomous software, those same links can become an autonomous snake-like robot that can move itself within a worksite. Our business roadmap is to evolve from pure hardware sales to robots as a service as our ability to navigate and locomote expands towards large-scale data collection from mass-deployed FlexBots. Our team has worked at leading organizations before joining Flex and are deeply passionate about solving real-world problems with mass-deployable robotic solutions. We've raised $500,000 in convertible notes and are preparing our go-to-market seed round raise for the beginning of 2022. To learn more, please check out our website and subscribe to our socials. Great. Thank you so much, Flex Solutions. Next up, we have Dynamic Infrastructure. Dynamic Infrastructure provides a live and proactive cloud-based system which autom aut automatically extracts and predicts precise actionable information from existing critical transportation infrastructure imagery. Dynamic Infrastructure, welcome. Hi, my name is Sal Dickman and I'm Dyn Dynamic Infrastructure CEO. Uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, global civil infrastructure, we're definitely in a crisis. Bridge, tunnels, dams, and roads are poorly maintained all over the world. In order to manage big crises, usually we have an ER assessing, the, assessing what's happening out there and taking quick decisions. We are the ER of the civil infrastructure world. In a matter of days, and with the, with the artificial intelligence, we know how to digitize analyze and perform risk assessment for hundreds for hundred of assets in a matter of days. We deliver man, maintenance manager, maintenance engineers and their manager the, accu the accurate information to take the relevant decisions. Our customers, uh, our customers save lives and money and better perform when it comes to preventive and predictive maintenance. And it's happening from the US through Europe to Australia. And we already possess over 1000 assets supporting uh, counties, P3s, and states, and states. The magic happened when we combined software as a service, existing photos our customers already own, and AI. The outcome is visual medical record for each defect and each assets. And it all starts here from photos that were collected by the owner of the assets from drones, past inspection reports, and smartphones. We analyzed them for any small anomalies and we create visual me medical record. You would be surprised uh, what, what, how, look, how the faces of our customers and partners looks when it comes to, uh, uh, to such visual medical records. We're actually closing gaps of decades working manually, uh, providing them very clear visual observation of what's happening uh, within their assets. In the end, we combine everything to a single coherent and accessible uh, digital twin. It can be 3D based or just a photo base will combine the visual medical record to the right places on the assets. Uh, you'll be surprised, but 98% of the global civil infrastructure is managed with spreadsheets and Google and Google Maps, and that's mainly because um, countries, districts, P3s project cannot afford in, uh, in big investments in legacy system and uh, many years in integration, and that's exactly our market out there. We raise to scale. We uh, we partner to scale. We invite you to join us to uh, drive this, this revolution forward. We actually processing hundreds of thousands, hundreds of assets uh, all over the world, and that's amazing. The team is a combination of very experienced technology uh, technology leader, leaders, artificial intelligence, and uh, concession uh, concession pros. And we're also very proud of our visionaries that support us. It's the former government uh, leaders 
but also uh, uh, the former manager of a Bentley system, the, for the product manager of Bentley system. And with that, I would like to thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dynamic Infrastructure. Next up, Cybrick. Cybrick Pro Project Intelligence is a cloud-based AI platform for radically improving engineering and construction projects. The virtual floor is yours, Team Cybrick. Hi, my name is Matt. I'm the founder and CEO of Cybrick. We're building a cloud-based platform to help project teams automate processes, avoid rework, and manage change. The engineering construction industry is broken and ripe for disruption, wasting $1.6 trillion per year. So what's going wrong? At the heart of the problem is an out-of-date approach to data management, an approach that can no longer deal with the size, complexity, and regulations that we have to deal with in modern projects. As a project manager myself with 16 years experience in delivering projects up to $150 million in value, I know firsthand that the outdated systems we work with today only result in one thing, chaos. This chaos results in huge amounts of waste across our projects. An average team member spending 23 hours a month looking for the information they need. A $100 million project losing $9 million because of rework. And 30% of our projects ending in lengthy and expensive contract disputes. As a project manager, it was my job to navigate this chaos. I knew there had to be a better way. What I needed was a map. We started Cybrick to create that map to transform project delivery by taking a data first approach. As a team, we have 36 years experience in major project delivery and 12 years experience in de developing AI solutions for industry. Our data management platform is designed for engineers by engineers with a simple user interface that integrates into current workflows. A series of smart bots then process, understand and automate data and provide insights that even most experienced project managers may be unaware of. Existing solutions are just digitizing old ways of working, ways of working that are wasteful and causing more problems than they solve. We are using our knowledge of industry combined with cutting edge skills in automation and AI to take a different, more agile approach to project delivery. One that learns and grows as the project develops and one that drives constant improvement across the organization. Since our incorporation in July 2020, we have made great progress. We have released our MVP with post revenue and working with a number of strategic clients to pilot our technology. In our most recent pilot, we took a process that was taking the client eight to 40 hours to complete per engineer down to five to 15 minutes, delivering meaningful return on investment to them. Along the way, we've been supported by plug and play mass challenge and textiles and have raised $500,000 in investment from angels, a strategic investor and an institutional investor called Loyal VC. We are now in private beta of our cloud platform and looking to run more pilots of our technology with strategic partners. Looking ahead, we'll release our system as a SaaS in 2022. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today and would love to continue the conversation about how a data first approach can transform an industry ripe for disruption. Awesome. Thank you so much, Team Cybrick. So now you should see another poll pop up on your screen. The five startups included in this poll are Lidex, Beware, Flex Solutions, Dynamic Infrastructure, and Cybrick. Again, if you're interested in meeting any of these startups, you should fill out the poll now, and we can facilitate the introductions after the completion of the expo. Um, again, the uh, startups included are Lidex, Beware, Flex Solutions, Dynamic Infrastructure, and Cybrick. Hi, I'm Karen Sabbath, one of the founders of TBM Designs. Our invert self-shading window system is the solution to your solar heat gain problem. Chances are you've been in many commercial buildings with floor to ceiling windows where the heat from the sun causes the air conditioning to be on full blast. This is inefficient at best, but is far worse because of the energy use and costs to run the air conditioning and the harmful emissions that result. TBM's invert self-shading window product is the solution. It uses zero energy to save energy, providing shading with no human intervention or wiring or controls, and it does that by using smart materials sealed inside the IGU taking a product that's been around for more than 100 years using in a new way, our co-founder patented the use of thermobimetal between glass that responds to the heat from the sun so the grid pieces flip and block the sun from coming into the building. This reduces solar heat gain, lowers energy use and costs, and provides tremendous benefits to human wellness. In fact, invert reduces energy use by more than 25%, while also allowing full color spectrum through the system with tremendous visibility. Competitor products are fully darkening and provide no more than 5% visibility 
whereas our system provides more than 65%, a total game changer for human wellness. Spending 90% of our time indoors, the research on the benefits to wellness from daylighting and views is significant, proving time and again that the benefits to wellness result in higher productivity and human retention. We currently have installations in Southern California. At Cal State Long Beach, we have a repurposed shipping container which combines art and sustainability in our smart box. Energy monitoring in the smart box validates the more than 25% energy saving. In Hawthorne, we're honored to have installed invert in the entryway door of the sustainably minded architects of Brooks Scarpa. We've also installed invert at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator's LaCretz campus run by LADWP. Our team is ready to work with you. We know the product works as our current installations show. It's not only functional, but a beautiful design that can elevate any project to be energy efficient and climate centric while also having incredible aesthetic appeal. This really needs to be in your next project or in your sustainability portfolio. Don't just take our word for it. The industry has spoken with Invert receiving numerous high profile recognition. In fact, Invert was just awarded the National Design Award for Climate Action from the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Museum. It's more than time for commercial buildings to directly reduce their 40% share of emissions and their impact on the climate. The Invert self-shading window system is essential to that solution. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, TBM Designs. Isaac is our next startup. Isaac offers solutions for the diagnosis, monitoring, and seismic protection of already existing buildings by means of non-invasive and patented technologies. Please welcome Isaac. Good morning to everyone. I'm Alberto Bussini, CEO and founder of Isaac, Italian innovative startup dedicated to the seismic retrofit of already existing buildings thanks to innovative technologies. Indeed, we approached the market that only in the last 20 years has experienced human lives and economic losses up to 29 billion euros. Usually the market is characterized by technological solutions which create discomfort for the residents, are un practically unscalable since they uh, require to be designed for each analyzed case, and they are very much invasive. And when we are speaking of seismic retrofit, usually we find images like this one, or this one, or this one. So we did it with the iPro1 solution, which is an electro-hydraulic machine, uh, which is standard, meaning that we just need to, be, to install those machines on the roof of the building together with motions, uh, motion sensor along the height, and meaning that is a one-size-fits-all fits all solution. So the bigger the building, the higher the number of systems to be installed. It's a system that can be applied according to international standards like the ISO 3010 of 2017. The system has been designed, realized and tested in the most famous European laboratories for seismic engineering, where we actually constructed two real scale structures and on one of them we put one of our machines. The effect can actually uh, be seen uh, in, uh, the, in those videos which uh, actually are an extract of the experimental campaign, which uh, has been done for three days. And this is actually the, the last earthquake, so the, um, the most powerful. It was the same of Irpinia of 1980. And uh, you can see on the left the structure without our machine, and on the right the structure with our machine. The fact is that the, the structure without our machine has, has um, almost collapsed, because the, the non-structural elements collapsed and the structural elements uh, experienced a uh, high level of damages. Indeed, uh, in uh, these images, you can see that cracks, the, oh, cracks opened in the concrete. Our business model is a B2B2C model, meaning that our clients or distributors are the construction companies, engineering studios, and general contractors, while the final beneficiaries are the private owners and the public entities. The typical competitors have um, solutions which, which are high invasive and uh, with very low in standardization since ad hoc solutions are required, while Isaac stands um, among those companies because we have a high standardized solution with low invasivity, meaning that it's easier to, to, to be installed. Uh, and we also completed, thanks also to this uh, development of the company, um, two rounds of investment, the first one of more than uh, 500,000 euro and uh, the second one of more than 100 uh, million and 500,000 euros.
It's a team that is, com is growing day by day. We started uh, almost uh, two years ago, but imagine that six months ago we were three people, now we are 16, so we are growing day by day. And we are supported by, sen with, by senior advisors uh, from the financial, uh, strategic uh, and technical point of view. And we hope indeed uh, in, the, in the future, in the near future, to expand also to outside Italy, for example in uh, Turkey, Israel, New Zealand uh, and hopefully in the US, in California. Already different people and entities already believed in us and uh, we hope that uh, also plug and play and um, other construction partners will believe, in, will believe in us uh, uh, thanks also to this program. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Isaac. Up next, we have Conkiller. Conkiller, the leading platform allowing the reuse of construction materials from leftovers and demolitions by applying the principles of circular economy and urban mining. Welcome, Conkiller. Hi, I am Julius, one of the co-founders of Conkula. With Conkula, we are bringing circularity into the built environment. Today, 60% of global waste and 40% of global GHG emissions are coming from the construction sector. We take resources from our environment, create materials and products, and after the lifetime of the building, they become waste. But in a circular economy, buildings become material banks and the material source for new buildings and products of many industries. With the EU taxonomy for sustainable finance and other regulations for reuse and recycling, a gigantic market opportunity is evolving. Our team is working in that field for several years. We already built Europe's largest marketplace for reclaimed materials. We are a growing team of experts from the construction sector and digital space. Through our experience, we have learned that circular construction on a B2B level is all about data and timing. Therefore, we created Concula, a digital ecosystem for circular construction that makes reuse and recycling easy, profitable, and measurable for all stakeholders. With Concula, you can assess and digitize materials in existing buildings and create material passports. With our matchmaking system, we sell materials on autopilot. The demand is coming from planned buildings or, for example, manufacturers that establish take-back systems. We also measure the impact with our integrated LCA calculation to create data for ESG reportings or CO2 certificates. Today, we work together with the largest project developers, manufacturers, and even cities in Germany. Our current revenue is coming from platform fees, commission on sales, and assessment as a service. This year, we expect a revenue target from around 1.2 million euros or more. We are looking for investors to invest in our team and product to scale up our users and building passports. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Conkiller. Up next, we have Climate X. Climate X helps by providing location-specific physical risk data and analytics, quantifying the probability and severity of extreme weather events at the asset level. Please welcome Climate X. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Propo, and I'm the commercial strategy manager here at Climate X. And what we do is we provide climate intelligence that you can trust. Uh, so why does climate change matter? I think everybody is quite aware of what's happening in the world around them. You don't necessarily need to look too far to see the impacts of climate change, whether it's the recent floods in Germany, the forest fires in North America, or even the cold snap in Texas that caused a multi-day power outage. It doesn't really matter where you are, regardless of your industry, these climate-related physical risks are an increasing concern. Now, one of the positive things that we started to see is that governments, regulators, and investors are all mandated, uh, are all mandating institutions and corporations to start undertaking detailed climate assessments, uh, more importantly, to build resiliency around the future perils and risk that we will face. And that's where Climate Acts comes in, to provide the data that's needed to underpin those assessments. And what we do is we project the probability and severity of different weather events all the way through 2100 at an asset level granularity. And we do it in some really interesting ways. So there's a couple things that are really key here. 
One is that we take a number of climate scenarios that people are interested in, whether it's high emissions or low emission scenarios, it doesn't matter. We can upload whichever ones you deem more relevant to your industry or business. The next step is to get an inventory of past data. So we'll take a combination of satellite imagery, which includes SAR data, LIDAR data, to get a view of what is happening on the ground at a really high resolution. And if we have strong local data, we will use it. But if not, it's not really a problem because we've already got well-trained models, which removes the reliance on local data. We then project forward into the future uh, under different climate scenarios by creating synthetic environment of the location in our digital twin modeling mechanism. So we literally simulate the laws of physics to understand how different climate scenarios will play out in a particular location and what the risk will look like as a consequence. Finally, we package all of this up into a simple API or an online portal that customers can use. So all you have to do is import your assets or provide the location, and then we generate the hazard map onto which you'll see your pins laid out. And then you can start taking action on mitigating those risks. So why ClimateX, you ask? We built a truly vertically integrated solution that meet regulatory requirements and trusted by academia. So everything is packaged up under one roof. We also have a world-class team that's leading the project. And you'll see some of these folks on the screen, comprised of the UK's top climate scientists and founders with extensive financial backgrounds so that we can provide the data that is purposeful and translatable to any industry. And thank you for listening. And for those interested in learning more about how you can make your business more climate resilient, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, ClimateX. And for the last startup of the day, we have Carbon Upcycling. Carbon Upcycling Technologies uses the waste of today to build a better tomorrow by converting CO2 gas into solid products. Please welcome Carbon Upcycling Technologies. Hello, my name is Natalie Julio and I work for Carbon Upcycling Technologies, where we have the vision of taking the waste of today and building a better tomorrow. We have developed a technology that takes CO2 and permanently captures it in concrete additives that when used can lower the cement content of concrete and the overall carbon footprint by 20%. The production of cement and the pouring of concrete equate to about 7% of the emissions we emit annually. Each person uses the equivalent of 3,000 kilograms of concrete each year as the equivalent of building in New York City every month until 2030. Concrete has been an essential building tool for us over the last hundreds and hundreds of years, but we need to find a way to build better and build more sustainably with the concrete we rely on every day. Companies have solutions um, that they can look at in the CC West industry, they can look at alternative cements and using alternative heat sources. But what's available today for them to use to start lowering their carbon footprint now? and that's carbon upcycling technology. We have developed a proprietary technology that creates CO2 enhanced additives that can be used in blended cements or in concrete to lower the cement content, but still increase strength and durability. We are creating Concrete 2.0. We have industry leading performance and cost metrics. We have a lower carbon solution that is stronger, uses less cement and is cost neutral against other um, mixes on the market. We essentially are creating a CO2 enhanced concrete additive that creates greener, stronger, and more durable concrete. When we look at concrete, we expect it to perform for the houses we live in and the buildings we work in and the streets we drive on. We are seeing improvements in strength and durability improvements across the board, better protecting us from corrosion and protecting the rebar we use to build um, concrete structures every day. To date, we have scaled our technology over 10 million times, and we were awarded the X Factor Award from the Carbon X Prize earlier this year. Commercially, we have signed MOUs with three of the world's largest cement and concrete companies and secured over $11 million in grant funding since 2014. We are seeing a push across the industry uh, from the government and provincial level uh, to even municipality levels for demanding low carbon concrete. But there has to be solutions available like ours to start making these, um, start meeting the goals of these uh, government bodies. We have a production facility set up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada that has a 20 ton batch reactor 
and it's fully operational producing material for the local concrete market. Our goal from here is to engineer and design a reactor um, that does a 200 ton per day um, treatment facility. So going from our 20 ton batch reactor now up to a 200 ton per day facility. We're going to market by licensing our technology to large concrete and cement players or producing and operating our own facility out of source and selling it directly into the cement and concrete market. All the success that I have demonstrated today is, has been completed by our core team of six individuals who are driven to have carbon upcycling technologies be the leading carbon tech company of the 2020s. We are backed by an amazing panel of advisors from the carbon, cement, financial, and technical services industry. If you have been inspired by our vision, help us launch the carbon age and help us bring greener, stronger, and more durable concrete to the market. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carbon Upcycling. And that was our last startup for the day, and that wraps up the startup pitches. So now you should see another poll pop up on your screen. Uh, the five startups included in this poll are TBM Designs, Isaac, Conkiller, ClimateX, and Carbon Upcycling. Again, if you're interested in meeting any of these startups and would like introductions, you can now fill out the poll and we will facilitate the introductions after the expo. Um, again, the startups included in this poll are TBM Designs, Isaac, Conkiller, ClimateX, and Carbon Upcycling. Overall, we really hope that you learned a lot from these quick pitches and about the tech that is changing the industry. On behalf of our team, I would like to thank all the startups that participated today and the partners that participated in the program. This would not have been possible without you. We also would like to thank everyone who attended this event today. We also would like to invite, invite you to the rest of the expos this week. Um, energy will be tomorrow, followed by mobility on Wednesday, and travel on Thursday. As far as upcoming events go, Plug and Play is proud to host a startup pitch event partnering with Neto and Jetro. We will have six clean tech startups present their product. This event will happen on the 9th of December, 2021. Please feel free to register for the event below using the link. Finally, as the world is slowly opening up, we are excited to have in-person events next year. In 2022, from June 12th to the 18th, we will host our summer summit at our headquarters in Sunnyvale, California. So everyone who tuned in today virtually, we hope to see you in person next year for our expo. With that said, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Stay safe and have a great rest of your week.